Lokyanathaya Shri Mahavishnavi Swaha. These are two shlokas from the Vaidyanatha Stotra and Sri Dhanvantri Mahamantra. The PDF book and the chanting video are on the SSVD website. My name is Vasu Murthy. Uh, Subram Subramaniam Jayaraman and Mandu Sharan are fellow volunteers and board members. We are helping with the technical arrangements along with them and along with the chairperson of the board, Prabhakar, and with the rest of the board members, Acharyas, staff, and our esteemed panel of doctors. We want to welcome all of you to the SSVT COVID-19 E-Town Hall with community doctors. The whole world is going through difficult times due to the coronavirus. SSVT is complying with government policies and is live streaming religious services to help the devotees to be in a prayerful atmosphere and to give comfort and solace even when they are at home. Our thanks to Acharyas and staff who are doing excellent work to keep the pujas and live streaming going. Our thoughts and prayers are with everyone who is suffering during this difficult time. Governor of Maryland, Larry Hogan, had declared yesterday, May 2nd, as the Healthcare Heroes Day. Blue Angel jets and Thunderbird jets flew over the Maryland's and Maryland, DC, and Virginia to pay tribute to the healthcare professionals who are doing heroic service during these difficult times. Let's give them a big round of thanks, congratulations, and applause to the healthcare heroes who are in this panel and who are outside. These professionals on the panel do outstanding work as busy medical professionals. In addition, they all serve as the community with stellar service. All of them are community leaders and have done human service and are the backbone of this temple and several other community organizations. Finally, they are some of the finest human beings we will see. They are the role models for everyone. No wonder medical professionals are now being referred to as gods and goddesses. Some logistics for the meeting. You can submit questions by posting them in the Q&A window. Due to the number of participants, we will not be taking questions by audio. We have received some advanced questions already. We'll starting with them. There will be about 30 minutes of presentations followed by a Q&A moderated by Dr. Shiva Subramaniam. I want to introduce Dr. Shiva Subramaniam. He is the professor of pediatrics and OBGYN at the MedStar Georgetown University Hospital, Washington, DC. He is also one of the founder trustees of the Shiva Vishnu Temple. He works with many other community organizations such as Interfaith Council, etc., and has many other accomplishments that are too numerous to list here. With this, I will hand over control to Dr. Shiva Subramaniam to introduce the panel and take it from there. Dr. Shiva Subramaniam. Thank you, Vasu. <clears throat> and I also want to add uh, our thanks to C. Shiva Vishnu Temple, the Board of Trustees, and uh, the three Board of Trustees, uh, Vasu, Manju, and uh, Jai Raman, helping us technically put this together. And um, so we really appreciate it. <clears throat> we thought this was a, a good session to share the current information, which you all should know, you know, keep changing, you know, all the time. And uh, so we need to keep updating it. So we, it may be the first of few more sessions, if that is necessary, you know, that we will um, try to bring it to you. Um, as uh, Asuji said, you know, please add your questions as you are listening to the presentation. And uh, uh, so that I think put it as much as possible in the question and answer session, uh, question and answer uh, box in the bottom of your you know, panel. And uh, uh, with that, uh, I would like to move, thank uh, the physicians who have accepted to be present here and to be able to um, give the time and effort to address the facts. The first 30 minutes we will spend in giving the PowerPoint slides, and then we will uh, start with question and answers, and the other panelists will also chime in with their expertise. Um, with that, let me start uh, mentioning all the um, physicians who are here. Uh, Dr. Chetna Rao, uh, who is an internist and is in private practice in Virginia and uh, with Prima Medicine, and uh, she will be starting off the session after I finish the introduction for everybody else. And uh, so thank you very much. And uh, then Dr. Uh, Nara Simon, 
who is an infectious disease specialist, who we are fortunate to have to address specific questions about coronavirus and its related uh, issues. And he has uh, treated uh, and been present in the previous you know, epidemics and, uh, uh, you know, and he's also facing the pandemic, I'm sure like us uh, as well. So thank you. And uh, we have Dr. Ram Nagula, in, who is a gastroenterologist and internist who will bring in some of the critical points that are different uh, in the United States in terms of the presentation, you know, as well as add his expertise you know, to this topic. And not last but not least is Dr. Rajagopal Rao Tripurneni, you know, who is an emergency room physician. And I know many of you have questions about you know, what to do, and he, you are getting it from right straight from an emergency room physician. So we have assembled, and there are many other specialists in our congregation who can also uh, be the panelist. So we are trying to um, limit it so that we can keep time wise, we can keep it in um, reasonable time presentation. So with that, uh, I would like to, to ask uh, Dr. Chetna Rao to start the presentation. Dr. Rao. Good morning, namaste. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shiva for that wonderful introduction and uh, thank you to SSVT for allowing us to do this. Um, with that, let me start my uh, PowerPoint presentation here. I'm gonna go ahead and start sharing my screen. Uh, I'm gonna go through this quite quickly because we are kind of um, short on time, um, but we will go over some of these things later on and um, the other panelists will add to it as well after, the fa after, what we are, uh, after we are done. So the first thing I wanted to kind of go over is, and most of you know some of these things, so it may be a repetitive thing, but just to kind of make sure that we are completely going over things. First thing I wanted to say is what is a coronavirus? The coronavirus that we have currently, which uh, is also called SARS-CoV-19 uh, is, um, SARS-CoV-2, sorry, and COVID-19 is, it's a novel virus. It's found in animals and it has jumped to humans. The reason uh, we're kind of uh, having difficulty and seeing this pandemic is because we do not have immunity to it because our body and immune system has never seen it before. Uh, and it's also causing human to human transmission. And this is the classic way the, um, the virus looks with all of the uh, protrusions here. And uh, supposedly it looks like a crown. That's why it's called the coronavirus. The next slide I wanted to show you was the one where uh, we talk about infectivity. In general, um, infectivity for a lot of the infectious diseases is much lesser than that of COVID-19. For example, with flu, um, one person infects one per another person or less. But with COVID-19, as you can see, uh, it infects two to 2.5 people. So one infected person can infect like two to three people, two to 2.5 people is what we said. We can of, of course do half a person, but this is an average. And you can see the comparison between that and the other um, kinds of uh, serious illnesses that we have here. Going to the next slide, I wanted to talk to you about the symptoms of COVID. Uh, the most common symptoms that we see in COVID are fever, of course. 95% uh, of the COVID patients have fever. That doesn't mean that everybody is gonna have it. There are some exceptions, including uh, some of the patients who are in nursing facilities and things like that, where we may not see some fever. We also see that a cough, especially a dry cough is a very common uh, thing that we see with this. Shortness of breath, difficulty breathing, uh, chills, especially shaking chills is what was added on as a new symptom. Muscle pain, severe muscle pain uh, in various muscle groups, especially big muscle groups are very, very common. Headache and neurological symptoms, symptoms similar to stroke are being seen a lot. And this has been described more and more in the United States. Uh, sore throat, a new loss of sensation of taste or smell is another common thing that we are seeing with, uh, with this condition as well. A pink eye or any kind of um, discharge from the eye or an eye issue is a more, another important thing to keep a lookout for. 
diarrhea and GI symptoms, again, being increasingly noted in the United States. And um, this is also commonly being seen more and more described in the United States as well. The next slide I wanted to go over was about susceptibility. So who is the person who is more susceptible? Of course, everybody is susceptible to COVID. There is no group of uh, people who are not susceptible. There are some which have less susceptibility, but the people who are at higher susceptibility include people with older age groups, especially 65 and older, other comorbidities. And I know we already have some questions about this and we will address that later on. Um, that includes diabetes, uh, especially poorly controlled diabetes, lung problems, uh, obesity. This has been seen increasingly as a risk factor, especially in the newer studies which are coming out of uh, New York and New Jersey. Um, the JAMA just recently published a study regarding that. That's one of the major risk factors we are seeing. Cancer, uh, autoimmune diseases, and that can include a lot of things like uh, rheumatological conditions and other things. And anybody who's immunocompromised, for example, being treated by uh, with chemotherapy, for example, those people are at a higher susceptibility for this disease. Healthcare workers and other frontline workers, because uh, we come in contact with uh, people who are very sick and also because of certain other conditions we'll talk about in just a minute. Um, children less than one year of age, uh, people who are in 16 to 25 year age group, we're seeing more hospitalizations, especially in the United States. Going to the next slide here. Uh, I want you to watch out for some danger signs. These are important because these are the signs which you will you know, uh, seek more help and um, kind of improve your uh, chances of um, getting help in case you, uh, you need to if you're looking out for it. Anybody who has trouble breathing, so if you're not able to catch your breath, if you're not able to speak in full sentences, that's an important sign. That could be a danger sign. Any persistent pain or pressure in your chest area, some people describe a burning sensation in the chest, important sign for that. Uh, any new confusion, inability to arouse, feeling of weakness in your body, one side or another, um, not able to um, you know, focus, things like that. Those are also can be signs of coronavirus. These are the neurological signs. And we're seeing that increasingly more and more. Um, a bluish color to your lips of face means that you're not getting enough oxygen to your different parts of your body. And this is also another thing that we are seeing more and more of because of the blood clotting issues associated with coronavirus. Uh, the last but not the least, a lot of cardiac issues, including palpitations, your heart is racing, you're uh, getting chest pain, you're not feeling good. All of those things can also be a sign of uh, a danger sign in the coronavirus. Now, who should get tested? These guidelines keep changing all the time. Again, I think Dr. Shiva has mentioned it. And these are uh, because the coronavirus is so new. And we're learning a lot of things, not just on a daily basis, but sometimes on an hourly basis. So please keep up to date with it. So don't take this as the only possibility, but this is what we know currently. So the current guidelines for the CDC, and again, this may change from time to time. These are the people who need to get tested. So it's also based on availability of the testing supplies and priority. So if you have a lot of testing supplies and um, available in the uh, community, like for example, they are gonna be manufacturing more and there is more uh, test kits which are coming out. Some things which, for example, only take a few minutes to get tested for and things like uh, get, to get the test results back, those will uh, change some of these um, guidelines as well. So people who are hospitalized or symptomatic healthcare workers, they obviously need to get uh, tested. Anybody who's symptomatic in a nursing facility, anybody age over 65, people with underlying medical conditions like lung problems, diabetes, immunosuppressed patients, symptomatic first responders, they all should get tested. And then the uh, people who have milder symptoms without underlying medical conditions, as resources permit, we need to test them or when testing becomes easily available. The next slide shows how the coronavirus spreads. So the main spread is people to people, for example, close contact. So somebody who is uh, hugging another person, they can get, um, if the, the person has coronavirus that spreads with, uh, with that contact. Respiratory droplets is the next uh, uh, method of transmission. Uh, and this is the reason why we're telling people to wear a mask now. This is not basically to get, prevent coronavirus from infecting the person with the mask, but it's actually to prevent them from spreading respiratory droplets to other people. 
contaminated surfaces. For example, if somebody who has um, coronavirus uh, touches a, a, a doorknob and another person touches that doorknob, the second person can get infected as well. So that's a common method of transmission, of course. So this, uh, this slide just shows us how, um, how far the droplets can drop and how far, uh, how, how much distance does it take for the droplet. So the, with the droplet, basically, um, we are looking at about a meter or six feet uh, distance is what we are telling people to stay away from. This is the reason why we're saying to do, I would call it physical distancing rather than social distancing, because social distancing means that you're not even talking to somebody or something like that. We are all engaged in our society and we're Obviously, we're engaged with our friends and family and things like that. So I would rather call it physical distancing. So where you're trying to be away from another person in order to prevent the spread of the virus. So that's one of the reasons why this, um, uh, this was designated um, to be done about to keep a distance of about six, uh, six um, feet from each other. So how do you protect yourself against uh, coronavirus? Uh, most important thing is washing hands. Uh, Dr. Narasimhan, our infectious disease um, panelist here, will tell you a little bit more about this because there's a specific technique for doing this. And that's very, very important. The second thing, if you don't have um, something available immediately to wash hands, you can definitely use a hand sanitizer, especially if you're out and about and you have a hand sanitizer in your uh, bag or your purse, then you can use that. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. This is, I cannot stress it enough. We are unconsciously always touching our face, our eyes, our nose, our mouth. Those are mucosal surfaces and those have uh, less barrier in order to get uh, coronavirus. So please avoid touching those areas. Avoid contact with sick people. Um, just do not, if you see, if you hear somebody coughing, somebody is not well, don't be in contact with them as much as possible. This prevents the spread of the virus and it'll you know, reduce the, like I said, uh, like we say, flatten the curve. Stay home as much as possible. Currently, we're still at uh, the guidelines for this. And I think we are gonna have um, maybe a panelist discussion in a couple of weeks to update you depending on how uh, things are going when um, uh, the states start opening up. Virginia has opened up slightly, and uh, but still people especially who are at a higher risk or who have the choice to work from home, please stay home as much as possible. Um, stay six feet away. Uh, again, I put in social distancing here, but I would call it physical distancing more than social distancing. Um, cover your nose and mouth with a cloth mask when outside. Again, one of the things I told you um, about transmission, um, droplets are transmitted up to six feet. And the cloth mask is basically to make sure that you do not spread it to other people. And the other person obviously should not spread it to you either. Uh, cover your coughs and sneezes. We typically say cough uh, or sneeze into your elbow. And that's, that's kind of helpful for that. Of, of course, obviously wash your hands or use a hand sanitizer afterwards as well. Um, and again, another thing which we're all uh, looking at and we even seeing the celebrities do is not shake hands. We're all uh, doing our Indian namaste now, um, and that's becoming more and more popular. Uh, clean and disinfect frequently touch surfaces daily, countertops, uh, any kind of doorknobs, things like that. Please clean and disinfect, disinfect them uh, regularly. Going to the next uh, slide, this kind of uh, just goes over the face mask types. Your surgical mask or your cloth mask is a one-way protection. It captures particles or droplets from the wearer. Typically, it's used to prevent the spread of common colds and flu. It's loose fitting and it's for the general population. For the N95, which is a part of the PPE, personal protective equipment that healthcare workers use, it's a two-way protection. It helps to filter the air entering and exiting the wearer. It also filters at least 95% of the airborne particles. It sits tightly on the face and it has to be fitted to your face type. There's a three different sizes to it and has to be fitted properly. If it doesn't get fitted properly, then it does not protect us. So it's important um, mainly for uh, you know healthcare workers. I've seen some people outside wear it. Um, again, we don't know what the efficacy of that is going to be because it's not really fitted. Wanted to give you some tips about running errands. The first thing I wanted to talk to you about was shopping. Um, 
some of these are very common sense and you can see uh, that you, you may already be doing some of these things already. Best thing for you to do if you can order online um, uh, is that's the that's the way to do it where you order online you're not in contact with anybody and they drop off uh, touchless drop off basically to your doorstep and then you pick up the uh, groceries from there or other items from there curbside pickup if, if possible so if they don't have uh, online ordering i know we've been backed up with a lot of things um, and i don't want to mention names but like for example instacart even got backed up for you uh, for ages now i think it's opening up a little bit um wear a mask wear a cloth mask outside. Whenever you go outside, wear a mask. I cannot emphasize that enough. Um, disinfect the handle of your cart. Carry some um, wipes with you. Disinfect the handle of the cart. A lot of the grocery stores and a lot of the other stores are now uh, you know, keeping it aside so that people can use that. Spend the least amount of time in the stores. Um, the, you know, put a shopping list on, uh, take it with you and use, the, use that for your guidance. Avoid touching your phone. Um, the phone goes near your ear, phone goes near your eyes and mouth. So please avoid touching your phone when you're grocery shopping. That way you can avoid um, uh, contact with your eyes, mouth, nose, and reduce the uh, risk of infection. Use a touchless payment method like credit card and other kinds of methods like Apple Pay uh, and things like that. Some other tips about other kinds of errands. Online banking, for example, ATM, clean and wipe before using. Use a hand sanitizer after collecting your mail or come and wash your hands. Uh, use a glove or use gloves or disinfectant wipes for pumping gas. It's important now, it's a changed world. We have to keep some of these things in our cars. We have to make a little packet or um, you know, put it in a Ziploc, keep it in your car so that you don't forget when you're going outside. Um, do a televisit with your doctor. A lot of the doctors, we had to scale up a lot. Um, I think probably before this epidemic, I don't know what the correct statistics is, maybe five to 10% of the physicians used to do televisits. I think now it's up to 90, 95%. So do ask your physician's office if they have a televisit available. A lot of it can be done online. Of course, you may need to go in if you're having an acute or an emergent issue. Uh, please do not neglect doing that. And this is what we're seeing is that people are neglecting to go into the doctor's office if they're having heart issues or other kinds of issues, do not neglect that. But if you are able to do a televisit with the doctor, that would reduce the risk of getting into problem. Um, online or phone orders to the pharmacy and delivery. Another important thing, if you have medicines that you take regularly, just have the pharmacy deliver it to your doorstep. The, almost all the pharmacies are doing it free of charge now. Okay, going to your next slide. So if you're sick, if you have mild symptoms, what do you do? Notify your physician, this is very important because they need to keep an eye on you. They need to know what is going on with you. They need to document in your chart. Um, the second thing is to monitor your temperature daily. Please get a good thermometer and keep that with you. Monitor your temperature daily uh, and you know, keep an eye on that. Um, stay in a separate room with an attached bathroom if it's possible. Uh, stay hydrated, drink plenty of fluids, uh, coconut water, water, Gatorade, anything like that is very, very helpful. Tylenol uh, as needed. If Tylenol is not working, you can definitely take ibuprofen. Initially, WHO had said not to use ibuprofen, but they've taken that, uh, uh, taken that off. Um, wash your hands often uh, and avoid interacting with other family members, especially the elderly or somebody with high risk issues. Um, keep, you can also keep a mask on when you're in the same room with them for a short time. Don't, do, uh, don't have um, you know, long exposure with them. Just something that was brought to uh, my attention by Dr. Shiva yesterday was uh, an article in the New York Times by an emergency room doctor about keeping a, a pulse oximeter at home. And we will address that. Uh, somebody had asked us a question about that as well. And um, I think we may be recommending uh, you know, people to do that as well um, uh, in the near future. There's no like uh, official recommendation about it, but it was a good article. Testing sites for COVID only if indicated. The first place to start is always your physician's office. So they may be able to write a test for you. Some of the physicians are doing a test in their office. They may have a quick test available for you. That's the place for you to start. Uh, in Northern Virginia, which I'm more familiar with, Inova, which is our big health system here, has a lot of testing sites in multiple locations. They will test you if you meet the criteria. The criteria changes every day. 
Um, so initially when we started, we had uh, people who were only very, very sick or things like that who were gonna meet the criteria. Now they've um, liberalized the criteria, more testing is available. They also have urgent care sites which are converted into respiratory clinics. Those are available in Tyson's, in Dallas South and Arlington. They're open for extended hours, including weekends. So you can definitely go in there to get checked out as well. And they do have drive-through sites as well. And uh, Virginia Hospital Center in Arlington also has a drive-through site available. Uh, GW is doing test center uh, testing in uh, DC as well as in Maryland. Uh, if you're a Kaiser Permanente patient, they, they have very good protocols and they're doing an extensive amount of testing. Shady Grove Hospital, Holy Cross Hospital, MedStar, uh, they all have drive-through drive testing facilities. And um, I have two website links here as well for you about Maryland and DC if you live in those areas. Uh, I do know that a lot of people are joining, from, uh, joining us from outside the DMV area. And the best thing to do for uh, people who are outside of the DMV area is to look up your health department. So for example, if you're in Dallas or um, anywhere in Texas or California, look up the health department, local health department. They do have a lot of uh, resources available. The second place to look up is the CDC. So CDC and the local health department have a lot of good information and you can definitely get uh, information about where to get the testing done there. Going to the do's and don'ts. Believe it or not, I actually did this before uh, the important uh, announcement came out about the bleach. Um, so the first don't I want to say is do not gargle bleach. No, not anytime anybody says that it does not, I don't care. We do not want anybody to gargle bleach. Don't spray alcohol or chlorine on your body. None of that helps. Uh, don't take any medicines for prevention without talking to your physician. I know there is a lot of things available, um, like a lot of information going about on um, various social media, WhatsApp and other kinds of things where people are taking um, you know, hydrochloroquine or other kinds of things. Look, please do not take any medicines for prevention. Please do not take anything unless you check with your doctor. Uh, don't take any medicines. Uh, I'm sorry, I uh, got a double on that one there. Uh, do wear a mask outside. Do self-quarantine if you're sick, meaning that you need to stay by yourself and make sure that you're not in contact with other family members. Do keep packages aside for 24 to 72 hours and um, that will also help to reduce the infectivity. Other considerations include uh, keeping important phone numbers either written out on a piece of paper or on your uh, phone where it can be easily access accessible. The reason I mentioned that is that if somebody needs to go to the emergency room and uh, the EMS takes them there, you're not allowed to have another person with you. Um, so you need, to, you need to have the phone numbers where the emergency room physician can call a next of kin, um, you know, things like that available um, uh, to them immediately. Uh, also, uh, uh, important phone numbers will include, for example, um, a close friend or um, your physician's office number, things like that. Keep a list of your medicines and allergies as well. That's very important. And have a medical bracelet if you have a condition which is going to be at a high risk, for example, diabetes or hypertension, or if you've had any heart conditions. Um, now, advanced directive, not to scare anybody, but this is, a, this is, not, this is not flu. Whatever anybody says, some, more, a lot of people will have a mild illness with coronavirus, but a lot of people will also get very sick with this. So it's important to have an advanced directive, especially if you do not want to have certain things done. For example, you don't want somebody to put a breathing tube down. You don't want to be on a respirator, things like that. You do want to have an advanced directive so that the ER physician is clear about what you want, uh, want them to do. Same thing with the EMS, keep that on your refrigerator typically is what we tell people to do is to keep that on your refrigerator so that the EMS can take a look at it. Um, I'm gonna briefly touch on the treatment and medications and this slide just, it's, it looks very nice and it shows how the coronavirus gets into the cell and everything um, and people can re uh, review it later on. So I'm gonna move on to the next slide. The current treatment options and managements for adults and children. Now remember, this keeps changing um, daily and sometimes hourly as uh, as we speak. So um, just always check with your physician before deciding on anything. So there is no definitive treatment available for pregnant women or children. And Dr. Shiva is going to touch upon that again. Um, 
you may have all heard about the remdesivir trial uh, that's ongoing and the preliminary data is out on that. It does reduce, um, there, there's a reduction in the number of days that somebody is admitted to the hospital and the reduction in the severity of the illness for people who are admitted in the hospital. And the preliminary reports suggest that there is a trend towards a reduction in mortality, although the uh, p-value was not um, completely there. So they're waiting to hear and waiting to do the complete study before um, uh, you know, uh, knowing what, what to, how to proceed. The FDA did approve it this week, um, and I think it was like a temporary approval based on um, you know, uh, preliminary data. And that can change, of course. Um, remdesivir is not something that a general population can use. This is only going to be available, and it's very, very hard to come by. It's only available in the hospital and in for critical care patients only. So this is not something that somebody can take and say, okay, I'm not going to get coronavirus. Uh, several anecdotal reports of treatment with multiple drugs, including anti-inflammatory drugs, uh, immunomodulatory drugs and treatments is available. Inhibitors of viral entry into the cell that includes the hydrochloroquine. Um, the, the immunomodulatory treatment is to prevent the cytokine storm that you might have heard about where there's inflammation in the body and that's causing problems. Um, examples of that include Actembra, that's a kind of medication. And now uh, the anti-inflammatory, um, there's several medications that they're looking into as well. Also, we are seeing more and more that a lot of the coronavirus patients are getting blood clots and uh, issues with uh, clotting in various different parts of the body. And uh, we're using more and more of blood thinners uh, when the patients need that. Um, convalescent plasma is another modality which is being used in various, various different places, including in your local places. So anybody who's recovered from coronavirus and um, has antibodies in their, in their plasma, they're using that antibody and transfusing it to the patient who's critically ill. And that is helping a lot of people recover from that. Again, a lot of trials are undergoing and um, there are definitely anecdotal reports about people getting better. So if you do have, um, uh, if you've recovered from this, a lot of organizations in the area are helping people, connecting people who have convalescent uh, uh, plasma to the people who need it. Uh, an example is SEVA and also uh, Red Crosses are also helping with, uh, with this as well. And uh, this just in, the vaccine um, is being studied at the Oxford Institute and uh, one of the uh, couple of Indian companies may be manufacturing this is what they're thinking. We're hoping that we should be able to get a vaccine um, maybe in a year or so. Uh, there's no human studies on disinfectants or light therapy uh, for obvious reasons. So I just wanted to put that in there. Uh, Post-COVID recovery. So talking about what happens, we can see that a, a lot of the people who recover from COVID will still have a lot of shortness of breath and that can, that can persist for weeks. Um, so if those are the people who need to stay home, hydrate and recover from this. This is a very bad illness. So it takes time to recover from this. Any palpitations because it affects the heart can persist or occur with minimal movement even. People can have liver damage that may take a while to get better. People can have kidney damage that may take a while to recover. And uh, we're also seeing more and more that people are being discharged on blood thinners, which they're saying to maybe use for 30 days and other kinds of things. So obviously that depends on what the uh, physician, discharge physician, physician tells you. So the emotional impact of COVID, we cannot emphasize enough about the emotional impact of COVID. It can be due to various different reasons, just isolating yourself uh, from your friends and family that itself can have a very, very si uh, significant emotional impact on people. So that's one of the things I was mentioning was the physical distancing instead of social distancing so that you connect with each other, connect with other people uh, by uh, FaceTime or Zoom or phone calls or other kinds of things so that you keep yourself from feeling that emotional isolation. And we're seeing a lot of increased anxiety and depression because of this uh, uh, because of this pandemic, for obvious reasons. One of them being isolation. Another of them being anxiety due to feeling that they may get infected. People may have uh, risk factors like high blood pressure and diabetes. And in the Indian community, we see a lot of it because a lot of the uh, we do have a lot of these risk factors. So that's important to keep that in the back of your mind um, and um, get help for it if needed. 
any kind of worsening of underlying problems can also be seen with this. And in, we are also seeing, unfortunately, increase in domestic violence and child abuse. And please report these things just like you would do in a regular situation. Um, we are also seeing a lot of interpersonal relationship issues and um, out of China, of course, we cannot believe everything from there, but still we're seeing that there's a lot of increase in incidents of uh, divorce and other kinds of things as well, unfortunately. Um, with this, um, I'm gonna say thank you for letting me present and I'm gonna um, uh, hand over the mic uh, to Dr. Shiva. And uh, again, thank you so much and namaste. Dr. Thank Shiva. you, Dr. Chetna Rao. Uh, great job of uh, presenting quickly many of these things. Um, I would now talk a little bit about COVID-19 in pregnancy, neonates and children, and very quickly, and then we can keep some of those questions that you may all have for in question and answer session. Um, the, the data from the China, Italy, and the USA as of now suggest a pediatric coronary coronavirus disease 2019, it might be less severe than cases in adults, and children might experience different symptoms than adults. Pregnant women have, may have the same risk as others. In these preliminary descriptions of pediatric COVID-19 cases, relatively few children with COVID-19 are hospitalized. Even though that may change, you know, from now till the next uh, month, you know, we'll need to keep that going, as Dr. Chetnarov said, uh, that things keep changing on a daily basis. Pediatric COVID-19 patients might not have fever or cough. This is something that you all have to remember. It is not the typical symptom that you see all the time. You do see sometimes, particularly in older uh, children in the closer to 16, 17, 18. But in others, the, they experience more of a GI symptoms and uh, stichypnea, a rapid breathing is more uh, often seen. And if they by the time they go to the shortness of breath, and, and, and we classically talk about tripod sign, and they are advanced. You know, they need to be rushed to the hospital if that is the case. Uh, severe outcomes have been rarely reported in children. It doesn't mean it does not happen. You know, there are unfortunately, particularly those who are less than a year old, and as well as uh, in the 17 to 25, there seems to be a slightly increased mortality. Um, but it is much less than the adults and particularly much less than the older people with uh, comorbidities. Even the children with comorbidities may have a higher incidence. Um, even though the pediatric patients may not have serious illness and may not have the typical symptoms, they may likely play an important role in the disease transmission. I mean, this is something that we have to keep that in mind. And in infants, in the, particularly the first few months, five, six months, the fecal oral transmission from the carrier children is, is also important. So if you're changing the diapers and all those things, it may be worthwhile to wash before and after changing the diapers uh, or wear the gloves and then remove the gloves and wash your hands uh, as well. Next slide. Um, the COVID positive mothers, you know, that means they have already been identified during pregnancy or at the time of the delivery or immediately after delivery as having COVID positive. And what are the neonatal outcomes? And um, so far, about 150 COVID positive mothers. I mean, this is obviously a much earlier data. Um, there have been a lot more now who gave birth to only about eight COVID positive neonates. And that too, with not 100% certainty that they came from the mother, it could be still be a contaminant after the delivery. Um, infected neonates were mostly asymptomatic, which is good. Yeah, few had mild respiratory distress, instability, uh, sepsis means infection-like symptoms, and likely attributable to concomitant conditions such as prematurity or sepsis. We, there are also few, thank you, uh, other stuff that happens during pregnancy that we are still evolving at this point. Um, at this point, we don't know whether there's a problem during pregnancy or delivery and there's not been, nothing been reported uh, as specifically that it happens. And the question of can COVID-19 be passed from a pregnant woman to the fetus or a newborn? No confirmed maternal neonatal vertical transmission so far. There is one case from Peru that was published last week 
uh, we still need to fully investigate that part. And so far that we know of that the neonates don't get transmitted from the mothers through their blood or the placenta at this point. In fact, the samples of amniotic fluid in the breast milk are negative for COVID-19 COVID uh, tests. Um, if they have COVID-19 during pregnancy, will it hurt the baby in any way? Obviously, we do not know fully at this time if any risk is posed to the infants of a pregnant woman who has COVID-19. But you know, the very small number of problems reported are primarily some mothers deliver prematurely and slightly higher than the normal uh, statistics. Uh, and, uh, but as I said, we don't see that the baby is affected. Um, and there are some, again, anecdotal reports are coming. Uh, next slide. Um, thank you. Um, the the COVID-19 issues in, in pregnancy, infancy, and children. I want to address the importance of maternal transfer of antibodies to the fetus. Um, the first three to four months are the most critical. In three ways it happens. Either the neonate uh, gets protected through the antibodies from the mother because the mother was infected and became immune. This may apply in mothers who become COVID-19 positive. Uh, they do produce antibodies. So if that comes during the late uh, pregnancy, they get transferred to the um, uh, ma mother, to the baby, and it protects the baby uh, in the, for the, at least the first three months uh, after the baby is born. Uh, and then they become low in antibodies, may become uh, susceptible. Uh, it also can be transferred to the placenta during pregnancy if a maternal vaccine is available. As I mentioned, there is no vaccine currently available. And the vaccine that was mentioned that in Oxford that was being tried with the hope that it might be by December, January might come through is still only a hope. There are many other vaccines that have been tried uh, that have not come through, including the for the HIV. We are still not, I don't have a vaccine, but let us always hope. I think that seems to be promising, but we will wait and see. There are a couple of other uh, companies also are developing them. But the most important part is the transfer through the fresh breast milk or breast milk feeding is the best way to transfer any antibodies of COVID positive mother. Next slide. Uh, I just wanna very quickly go through this. I, I wanna go, uh, there are many uh, recommendations that are made there, but there are differences. American Academy of Pediatrics recommends separating the baby and the mother after delivery if mother is COVID positive for at least 14 days. And the, in most of the situations. Whereas the European Union and Brazilian Department of Pediatric Society do not recommend separation unless the mom is extremely sick and in the intensive care unit. Next slide, please. WHO also has given very recently last week guidance and they recommend all recently pregnant women with COVID-19 or who have recovered from COVID-19 should be provided with information and counseling on safe infant feeding and appropriate infection prevention and control measures. What are they? The pregnant and recently pregnant women should be enabled and encouraged to attend routine antenatal postpartum care as appropriate so that they can learn all the ways how to manage themselves and the babies. And if there are obviously any additional problems, we need to provide help. Next slide. <coughs> The mothers and infants should be enabled to remain together and practice skin-to-skin -skin contact, kangaroo mother's care, and to remain together to practice rooming in throughout the day and night, especially immediately after birth, because the establishment of breastfeeding is very critical during the first several days or weeks, even though it can be done later too, but it is very important. And so they recommend, the WHO recommends, the including the symptomatic mothers, after delivery to, to breastfeed, practice skin-to-skin -skin contact or kangaroo care. And obviously they should practice respiratory hygiene, including before, during, and after feeding in terms of wearing a medical mask and then making sure before and after do hand hygiene, wash hands with soap water. And, uh, and, and then after the contact with the baby, and routinely clean and disinfect surfaces, very important, at home and the hospital 
with which the symptomatic mothers have been in contact. Next slide. Quickly, the last slide in terms of the key takeaways. The COVID-19 epidemic is an unprecedented challenge for all healthcare system worldwide. No specific treatment, um, nor vaccine exists today. Dr. Chetna Rao mentioned about some preliminary reports and also the FDA you know, gave <clears throat> yeah, what is called uh, UUA, you know, emergency urgent approval. And, uh, and that is simply uh, at this point is not the final and uh, the emergency use authorization is very preliminary. And, uh, and the vaccine is also hopeful, but not nothing yet at this point. Uh, which means we need to be careful about through this winter, uh, not alone for this corona, as well as for the flu as well. Uh, the pregnant women have similar issues like other adults. Children may be affected, but usually with less severity. Children may be carriers of the virus. This is what you have to be aware of. That is why schooling, so, um, closing the schools and colleges is mainly for that purpose, because the youngsters may be carriers without showing symptoms, and that will affect the rest of the population. Uh, as mentioned already, GI symptoms are much more common in children, and it looks like common in adults also here, and other panelists will mention. No vertical transmission from mom to baby, and uh, neonates can occasionally experience mild to moderate forms of the disease. So with that, let me close the presentation on this. Thank you so much. And uh, I just want to open up uh, for a few questions to answer, and so we get engaged. And uh, as uh, Dr. Chetna said, that it is not just, uh, it is physical separation and not uh, you know, separation from each other. And then after a few questions, we will come back to the other panelists to make their comments as well. And uh, so uh, addressing the questions that have come so far, um, there was one question about uh, those who are old age diabetics, who are otherwise normal, that means they are under control. They are diabetes under control, hypertension is controlled. Um, can they get tested? Can let me ask the uh, internal pan internist or infectious disease panelist to answer this question. Shiva, can you please repeat the question? Yes, and also please unmute, unmute your uh, microphones, uh, panelist. Um, this is from Rambala. Those who are old age diabetics. Uh, Etc. But who are otherwise under control and normal um, uh, physical exams, can they get tested? Um, it depends on the availability of testing. So um, it's the testing is becoming more and more available now. Uh, but typically, we're still saying to uh, wait until you get symptoms before getting tested. At least uh, right now in Virginia, that's what we're telling people to do. Uh, I think eventually community testing will become the norm. Uh, but currently, the um, based on how much availability we have, we're telling people to wait for the symptoms to occur. Okay. Um, and the other question is, uh, uh, I recently learned about SARS outbreak at MI Gardens, Hong, Hong Kong. You know, apparently something recently has come. Is this scenario possible with this coronavirus and the SARS also may have an outbreak is the question. Can one of you take the question, Dr. Narasimhan? Can you um, unmute your phone, please? Microphone, Dr. Narasimhan, unmute your phone. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, these are two different things. Um, multiple episodes can come up, um, but ongoing COVID-19 uh, uh, will keep going in one way, but that, is, that doesn't mean that the other related uh, family viruses will not produce the uh, disease, especially in areas that are more common uh, for them. Yeah, thank you. Um, also, please, uh, listeners, uh, remember, that we cannot give you personal advice on your medical condition. And you need to talk to your personal physician and uh, uh, to get specific answers to your specific situations. We will be able to give you only general answers. Please keep that in mind. And uh, there was an interesting question about uh, 
the aerosol effect of flushing the toilet. And uh, so the question is, it's better always to close the lid before the flushing. I would say COVID or non-COVID, you should do that. I mean, that is, yes, there is a uh, aerosol effect. You should uh, do that. Um, I don't have any information on whether after closing, whether do you have to clean the lid? Yeah, does anybody have any answers to that? Whether do you clean the lid of the toilet? I don't uh, think we Dr. have any Shiva, information. I don't, I don't think we have information regarding yes. that. But of course, one of the things which we tell people to do is that if somebody is known to have uh, COVID and they're self-isolating to try and use a separate bathroom so that they don't infect other people. So I think that might be something to think about, but if, if it's a possibility to do that. More than the aerosol effect, uh, the hand washing. Um, that is, yeah, because the, as Dr. Chetna Rao mentioned, the spread is, the virus is very small, but it is spreading through the droplets and the droplets are the ones that are causing major problems. That's why we keep the six feet distance, physical distance. The, these are like less than two microns, 1.5, 1 1.2, 2, 2 microns. So they are too small to be there. It's not a big uh, main track. It's a hypothesis. You know, it's not a like, browser or data to uh, support that. Yeah, I just want to uh, again remind the listeners to put your questions in the question and answer um, box that is there below. And uh, so we can answer this. Um, the, someone is asking the question that uh, if we have eye irritation, uh, not similar to pink eye, but no discharge, uh, just redness in the eye, itchiness in the corner of the eye, should we get tested? Not really. Um, not really. I think you should contact your doctor because the other conditions that Dr. Siva mentioned are much, much more common in the community. Uh, the pink eye is one of the findings, but again, the incidence of pink eye uh, is uh, is not as much as it is being noted in any different places. It's more common in the younger adults. The next question is also to Dr. Narasimhan. Uh, how often do we need to change gloves? And if you are at work or any common place, do I need to change gloves every time the doorknob is touched? The other part of the question is, how do I wear and remove the gloves so there is no contamination? Best thing is for you, because it takes a while for us to learn this, how to do it properly. Uh, the, it's a very, very important question. Um, um, the gloves need to be used when, it, when you bring it back. You know, it does, remember, it does have the um, um, uh, possibility, based on where you went, uh, to have the, the virus on it. Um, uh, you have to let, let it go. There are, we can discard it, but ideally we cannot keep discarding at that many houses, that many uh, gloves because we keep going out all the time. The, the best way to do it is to, to have brown bags, you know, for each of your family number. Put the gloves when you, after you finish using it, pick it up from the, on the edge of it, remove it, keep it in the brown bag at least for 48 hours, for two days before you reuse it. The other way to use it is, you know, essentially you can use it with uh, some disinfectant and things like that. But the easier way to do it is to keep it in brown bag and leave it alone for two to three days before you, re you reuse it. I'm going to uh, take one or two more questions. There are a lot more questions that are there. Um, and, but I want to give the panelists a chance to add their views. Um, is one is uh, uh, from uh, Atlanta, can we play sports such as tennis? as long as we maintain the norms for physical contact and use hand sanitizers. Uh, especially since there are some states like Georgia has opened up uh, uh, some of these things. So it is coming from that place. Um, short answers to this. Um, can we play sports such as tennis uh, as long as we maintain the norms and uh, uh, use hand sanitizers? Anyone can uh, take the question. Unmute yourself if you're answering, yeah. uh, Chetna, or uh, Dr. Rao. Yeah. Yes. Um, uh, I think uh, can, as long as you uh, 
have the physical distance uh, maintained for six feet. If you are uh, going to the net and trying to hit the ball and the other guy or girl is next to you, they are opposite to the net, maybe no, no, no. Those are very difficult situations. And um, since uh, they are huffing and puffing or they're playing, so there's a contamination issue. Uh, so as far as uh, I know, I think you can play probably, but at the net, you have to play your own game differently. Uh, I just want to add, uh, try to keep a mask on as well. Um, I would say just to kind of make sure that the droplets are not there. Any kind of sports, because uh, like Dr. Uh, Tripunini said that, um, you know, like you get huffing and puffing, so it can cause an aerosolized effect. Some of the newer studies are showing that if you're running or doing any sports, that there is some aerosol created. So definitely I wouldn't do doubles tennis it, if it is one-on-one, -on -one, then, um, you know, making sure that you're not, you know, coming into closer contact than the six feet and definitely not touching your eyes, nose and all of that stuff and um, keeping, a social, uh, keeping distance would be helpful. Okay, now I'm just gonna hold off on this now and uh, ask each panelist to say uh, briefly uh, some additional factors that have not been touched upon. And I say, as I uh, said, sometimes the questions will bring that up, but I would like to ask each one of you to very quickly in add to this. And I want to start with Dr. Tripurneni Rao because he is an emergency room physician to be able to say anything specific to your area. Uh, unmute the microphone, please. All right, uh, thank you, um, namaste. Uh, what I want to say is in the emergency room, it's mainly a lot of uh, public. Uh, I have the question of when should I go to the emergency room? Uh, the best thing is when you have symptoms, uh, especially if we are talking about COVID-19, uh, you have symptoms, the uh, best thing is to contact your healthcare provider and take their advice because things change uh, almost every day nowadays. So, but these are the symptoms where you have to keep in mind you have high fever, which is more than 100.4, temperature or difficulty breathing, chest pain or uh, you know tightness, which is continuously there, or sweating, or you have any discoloration of your lips or face or toes, uh, that's the time to call the 911. Uh, ambulance will come and pick you up. Make sure you tell them if you are in contact, if you are in contact with any COVID patients in the past, or there is a suspicion, let the 911 operator know that there is a possibility of COVID. So that way they will take uh, enough precautions to protect you as well as the others. Once you go to the emergency room, they will do the um, screening first. If you are going by with a pay in your own car with your wife or um, children driving you to the emergency room area, uh, they may screen you and then put you back into the emergency department, depending upon your symptoms. If there are mild symptoms, a doctor or a, another provider will see you and uh, depending upon the region where you are, you may be uh, sent home after the testing. So testing itself may take one, two, three hours, depending upon the uh, how many tests are being done because they are processed at least in um, Harford County in Maryland, they're testing uh, you know in batches. So if you take a test, it may take up to three hours. So, Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. And the I'd other like thing is, I just want to add is uh, please don't stay at home if you have any other normal other symptoms like a bad chest pain or a difficulty breathing or normally when you go to the emergency room, those symptoms you have to keep in mind. Make sure you go to the emergency room because there are a lot of uh, serious uh, things happen in the country because they are afraid to go to the emergency room, they may get coronavirus. I think, thank you very much. I think the, the last point is very important because people are afraid you know, and to go to the emergency room, even with the standard symptoms that should have, uh, you know, made sure that they go to the emergency room. And that I think is important, like the chest pain or, you know, difficulty in, you know, stroke symptoms and all that. Let me ask uh, Dr. Ram Nagula uh, to add any uh, comments from his area. Thank you, Dr. Shiva. Uh, my task is to share with you the digestive or gastrointestinal symptoms of COVID-19. First and foremost, 80% of the cases are mild. Only 5% of the cases need hospitalization and ICU care in general. Now, 
the virus enters through the human cell with a ACE2 receptors. These cells are most commonly seen in respiratory system as well as the digestive system. And that's the reason why these cells, the virus enters the cell, they multiply and cause damage into the, these two systems, respiratory and gastrointestinal. The recent data from US is collected in the Boston area, uh, including Harvard University and seven other community hospitals. They studied 318 patients in the hospital, meaning they're severely sick patients. They noted, unlike in China, unlike in Europe, 61% of the patients have at least one GI symptoms. 34% of the people have loss of appetite and 33% of them have diarrhea and the 24% will have nausea. And 14% of them have predominantly GI symptoms. That's what we need to keep in mind. In China and Europe, there are only five to 10% of the cases have GI symptoms. And the people with GI symptoms also have severe fatigue and body aches. Those are the things you know, we need to keep in mind. As the panelists mentioned, loss of taste and loss of smell also indicates more symptoms in the GI tract. These are things I want to just focus on and inform you. And thank you for your attention. Dr. Shiva, you are on mute. Shiva, you can't hear you. Yeah, I, you know, I always try to mute myself, you know, when I'm not talking and uh, didn't realize that. Um, so I want to ask Dr. Narasimhan to say a few words briefly, uh, because there are a lot of questions have come. I would like to go to the questions to get the answers. So briefly, please uh, give a few of your wisdom pearls. Namaste, everybody. Um, just finding out a few things. I think most of them were highlighted by Dr. Chetnar Shiva. How long is it going to go? How long is it going to be in this kind of a setting? Um, the expectation now is it can go up, usually up to two years. Um, it can be, the earliest could be 18 months. Uh, the farthest can be two years plus. Um, and the, the, key, the key point is 70% of the people have to be uh, immune uh, or have resistance uh, to, the, um, 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 uh, to the virus. That happens if you take if you take have vaccination or if you have had the disease. And so until that happens, the transition will not be happening. So until then, what do we do? Those are the points that were already mentioned. The the key point like the physical distancing, um, hand washing. Hand washing is a very critical one. The but you know everybody knows that we have to wash like 20 seconds to 30 seconds. The main thing is how do we wash our hands? The, the 20 and 30 seconds is for the soap to make a contact with our skin. So you rinse your hand, apply the soap, let the lather come up, and keep it, you know, keep cleaning your hands for 20 to 30 seconds, and then it is done. The more you wash hands, the better it is. If you go out, if you come back in, if you have any kind of exposure, the hand washing is a must. Of course, the mask and um, a, a portion of it was well covered already. The, um, why, why do we have, why, why, what is the difference between what the COVID-19 is doing and the other similar viruses in the past? Most of the people do not get symptoms. Many people, I should say, many people do not get symptoms, especially the, uh, the, younger, uh, the younger folks. In older people, and also people with the specific risk factors, then there's a, they, they have a pretty you know, negative income. When the virus settles down, it can cause direct damage to the tissues. That's what influenza and other things do. COVID does it too. But then the body responds producing the antibodies and, and that, by the way, trying to fight the virus out. When that happens, um, um, uh, the, the virus, virus is supposed to be taken care of. But the interesting thing about COVID-19 is it triggers an overwhelming response by the body to produce a lot more antibodies, a lot more immune response, 
which in turn produces a cytokine, cytokine like an enzyme which can be which can do a number of different things, damage to the body, it can affect the brain, it can cause encephalitis, it can cause a stroke, it affects the heart, causes myocarditis. We still do not know how it does that. It produces the the clotting or bleeding, either way, um, um, and the clotting can involve big blood vessels and drop in oxygen level and pretty, you know followed by death. So these are things that are more unique that uh, the 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 COVID nineteen is causing, and that's the problem. So until the two year period ends, the key for us is to essentially follow the the, the precautions that we need to do. It's not going to change no matter what the stages we go through in getting back to work and getting back to college and uh, you know, re re you know, resuming other uh, things that we do at, ho at home anytime. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Narsiman. Um, there are different scenarios, but I would like to ask uh, Vasuji whether he can read the questions that have come on the email um, ahead of time. Um, do you have uh, those questions, uh, Basuji? Sure, yeah, I will read one of them. Please. First one is, what is your recommendation regarding pulse oximeters? Should families purchase one and monitor oxygen levels of family members at least once a day? Uh, who among the panelists would like to address this? Um, I can talk a bit to that. Yeah. Um, you know, we typically as physicians, we say, you know, like not really to use a pulse oximeter and everything, but this pandemic is very different. And I think Dr. Shiva, you had sent an article about this recently that uh, was published by a uh, uh, ear physician in New York. And um, that one of the things that we are seeing with this particular condition is that people may not be really that short of breath, but their pulse oxygen may be quite low um, due to various different reasons. So uh, it may be a prudent idea if you can get a pulse oximeter to keep that with you, it may help to uh, diagnose the condition early and to be able to get early uh, available treatment. But don't need to rush out to get it. A most important thing is the physical distancing, keeping all the other things we talked about, like wearing a mask in public, making sure that you're washing your hands, all those things are very important. No need to stress out if you do not have a pulse oximeter. There are a couple of apps also on the phones that are available that may help you. Um, uh, Apple has one that you can buy and Android phone has one that's already built in uh, into the system, but uh, there may be caveats about that where the pulse oxygen level may be not uh, detectable under a certain amount. Um, so you know, if you can buy one, that's great, but you don't need to worry about you know, uh, going and having it mandatorily at home. Yeah, I mean, I just want to, I think because there are a lot more questions, you know, we will go with it. And uh, Vasu, keep uh, reading the email questions since they were sent ahead of time. Um, please uh, take those questions first and then we'll go to the, and by the way, there's a lot of questions that are there. We will try to stay as long as possible to answer the questions. Otherwise, we will try to make sure we provide the answers and uh, to all of you. Uh, and uh, Vasuji will explain in terms of how those answers will come. And uh, um, I will take the other questions from the email. Uh, Vasu, could you read them? Sure, yeah. We will publish any remaining answers to the remaining questions in the website after the, after the webinar, we'll do that. So the next question is, we understand that those with conditions like diabetes, hypertension at, are at higher risk. That said, if a condition such as hypertension is well managed, particularly in a patient that is under 60, is this still a contributing risk factor? Who would like to answer from the panel? You know? Not, uh, I so, can answer. Yeah. Go they, ahead. Yeah. Um, in general, you know, anything that is hyper well controlled as in that age group shouldn't be considered as a big risk factor. It will be like everybody else. You still have the risk of infection, but not necessarily. It, 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 it's the risk of uh, getting complications is pretty similar to the rest of the population. The risk is higher. And um, it has nothing to do with hypertension control in old age. It is the associated comorbidities like heart disease, hypertension, diabetes, and a combination of factors add to the uh, higher risk. Okay. Um, uh, Vasu, next question. 
Next question. If having source uh, COVID-2 antibodies does not guarantee immunity, as per WHO and recent studies, how would a vaccine be different? That is a preliminary information that came from WHO. And um, the, you know, the, 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 this, that's an observation that is being made more, more so in the United States that uh, patients develop, you know, looks like they're developing antibodies, but then they come back, they, 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 they continue to have the reinfection or what it may be reinfection or the continuing infection. And these observations should not be, you know, you cannot, you know, make the conclusion that vaccines will not work. We have to, the vaccines really try to generate the, the you know, it's directed against the protein and uh, they have to do the animal testing and human testing before it really becomes available to all of us. So there should not be a concern about vaccine if the vaccine is, um, they are able to prepare the vaccine the right way. In some of the other uh, other viruses before, the vaccine couldn't be, uh, you know, it could be used at one time, but the virus mutates and then subsequently that vaccine will not work. So you have to do it all over again. That can happen with this, but uh, the right now, the, the WHO reference for that, uh, the antibody being there, not effective, uh, not be considered to uh, say that vaccine will not be useful. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, we also need to keep the answers very brief because there are so many questions that are there. And uh, so let's, let's uh, be brief and succinct. And uh, Vasu, any other questions from the email? Yeah, a couple more. So the next one is we are senior citizens uh, with high blood pressure, cholesterol and taking medication. We usually have normal wellness checkups. We are landlocked from March 15. So there's several questions. How much time after population is resuming the new normal? Is it safe for us to go out? Um, Dr. Chetna Rao, do you want to address that? Sure. Uh, I think this will depend on the area and when the uh, when the um, uh, the guidelines are relaxed and things like that. Still, keep the social distance. I would say physical distancing rather than social distancing in mind. Keep your masks on and things like that. As long as you're well controlled on your uh, current issues and no other comorbid conditions, you can start doing things slowly. I would not do everything on the same day. For example, I wouldn't do grocery shopping and, uh, you know, do something else on the same day. So try to keep the number amount of exposure to a minimum still uh, to whatever is essential. Okay. okay. Thank you so much. The question on the same was how many related, uh, what triggers we have to look for before meeting and babysitting our grandkids? Who, who wants to take that question? You know, actually, th this is going to be the issue where it, it makes it very difficult because, you know, some of the things what Dr. Narsimhan has said, Dr. other panelists said, um, because we are not sure, uh, you know, how long it will take for this COVID really to die down. And so as far as the uh, older individuals, um, we need to really continue the physical distancing for quite some time, either at least when we get the vaccine or like Dr. Narsimhan said, there, there is a herd immunity that builds up over the next two years. And uh, so it's going to be uh, not easy you know, to answer. Also, I mentioned the young infants are the ones who may have um, silent carriers. And so when they start to go, older children go to school and come back, they may bring the disease. So you have to be extremely careful. This changes the way that we are going to be interacting with each other for at least a year, year and a half. Um, we will add additional answers to this question, very important. And uh, we, we will add this because there are similar questions about uh, grandkids visiting. Um, someone asked from Boston whether the kid two-year-old can come and visit. At this point, it's all a risky proposition. You know, if, if the panelists agree with me, because it is something that has not been contained, fully mitigated. You know, this, this needs a lot of testing, tracking, and uh, isolation to be able to happen. So I would, you know, not, it's a personal opinion, uh, recommend that we hold off on such visits 
at this point. Would the panelists disagree? So they can, if there is a disagreement, please add to your views, please. Yeah. Yes. Please. Uh, I, I agree with you what you said because it's very, uh, it's not decided yet for sure. But my advice in the sense as a physician is to get all the um, prophylactic shot, influenza shot, pneumonia shot, all the uh, immunizations uh, the elderly people normally get. Make sure you get those, uh, you know, immunization. That is one way to protect from the other disease, not COVID per se. At least you can protect the other one. But when you people get the symptoms, there are similar symptoms in all the viral illnesses, more or less. So that's why you have to be careful. As far as the children are concerned, if they are home to home, you know, it's very difficult to stop them. And you'd like to, it's a normal human behavior to be along with the people. So that is something yeah. to, we have to answer later. Once the Vaccine comes, uh, that will go away. Yeah. There is also, you know, issue of the vaccine. Obviously, we are giving an optimistic scenario that it could be ready by uh, January. But there is a lot of, uh, uh, if you look at the history, uh, you know, there are sometimes the vaccines are not developed at all. They have to run multiple trials. Sometimes it takes three to four years as one of the uh, audience uh, uh, sent the information. Um, you know, he knows all about uh, vaccines. So he said it may take even two to four, four years and sometimes never, as I mentioned about HIV. So we are hoping for the best, as uh, Dr. Tripunirov said. And uh, there was another question that uh, important because this is a very prevalent uh, uh, information. Uh, a question from Florida, uh, can healthy patients or persons take chloroquine, hydroxychloroquine, just as a prophylaxis? I would say no. Um, hydrochloroquine, especially hydrochloroquine, will have a lot of side effects. It's serious side effects. It is being used for other diseases now, like lupus. Um, it, there no, no research study so far has pointed any benefit in using it. This is for actually treating. It's not for prevention. Yeah, so that's uh, that's so, what I wanted to make sure. There yeah. is prophylaxis. I think I would keep the answer simple. No, there is no evidence of prophylaxis. Two, the treatment is being done, but uh, no clear clear proof by you know trials. I think that's probably the answer that we can do. Would you agree with Dr. Narasimhan? Would you agree with that? Yep. Yeah. Because I just want to make sure, because we have to answer a lot of questions, we want to address it as quickly as possible. Um, any other questions on the email, uh, Vasu? Uh, doc, Dr. Shiva, we got a couple of questions in uh, around, like what like you highlighted on general travel. Um, you know, yeah, I, I have several questions on that. Uh, we also got a couple of questions on, you know, like ordering takeout food. Yes, I see uh, it. Yeah. I see it. And uh, any, I just want to make sure the emails who have mailed there ahead of time, any remaining questions there um, before I move on to the rest. Final question. Uh, my granddaughter, 25, uh, got COVID-19 and recovered from it. Uh, will there be any side effects? What precautions are needed? Any one of the panelists and want to address that? So if I can understand correctly, they, um, they recovered already, yeah. already from yeah. COVID. Yeah. Correct. Okay. I mean, you know, they, the, if it was a mild infection and um, whether they were hospitalized or not hospitalized, all those things are going to be important. But uh, a lot of the young adults are recovering very well. I personally have about eight patients who have recovered extremely well, all of them doing really well. In, in fact, one 80 year old who's doing extremely well was only admitted for two days. So main thing is that they need to make sure that they are um, uh, hydrated, uh, staying home, they may need to be retested before they can, uh, you know, go back to work. They may need the um, the test again, the nas nasopharyngeal swab again, depending on what kind of work they do. Especially healthcare workers, they have to be rechecked before they can be allowed to go back to work. So that's that's going to be the most important things. Also, they can look into donating their convalescent plasma to help other people as well. Any other questions, Vasu? That completes all the email questions. Yes, yeah, thank you. And uh, this is a combined couple of questions. Uh, I'm going to ask, throw it to the panelists. Um, this is about ordering food from restaurants. What are the chances of picking up the virus? 
and not necessarily from the food, but also in terms of the, the box and the delivery and all that. So which one of you would like to take that question? I can uh, take I it. can take yeah. a step. Oh, sorry, doctor. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. Go ahead, yeah. Uh, I think uh, oh. that's fine. As long as you keep the bag, first of, first of all, handle with the gloves if you can, and take out the food out of the uh, bag or box, whatever come in. Leave the box outside, and uh, take the food and make sure you wipe it outside with the um, disinfectants. And then uh, the food must be always warmed up. Uh, you know, just like a general precaution every time you do that. So make sure it is uh, warmed up well and then uh, you can uh, consume. Main thing is leave the boxes outside. Um, that, that I think this is why you have to keep that in mind. Food itself is not a problem. In fact, there is a, there is a recommendation to actually do take out some food to support the restaurant business. You know, so there will be existence as long as you take the precautions that uh, you mentioned. Um, and as you know, there are 32 states who are opened up as of May 1st, and where they do allow 25% capacity uh, in terms of uh, visiting restaurants and all that. Um, but uh, listening from the panelists, I would strongly recommend that the, those people who are at the high risk group, susceptible group, should refrain themselves from visiting and maybe we will be able to come back and address it again later. Um, and uh, yeah, the, all the restaurant questions. Um, um, how to boost your immune system during COVID? Um, this I think is probably referring to the non-traditional medicines. As you know, all of us here are allopathic physicians and we don't necessarily uh, have the expertise of Ayurvedic, Yunani, or Siddha uh, medicine specialist, but we can share with you as to what those things are and, and depending upon uh, what you uh, do is safe and then you can do. Can someone address a few of the things? I'm going to throw a list at you guys and you can address, uh, maybe take a few at a time each one and then see. The first two or three, you know, let's see who wants to take it. Vitamin D, vitamin C, zinc, supplementation. Who wants to take it? Uh, I'll take yeah. it, Shiva. Yes, GI uh, specialist. These zinc, vitamin C, and vitamin D can boost some immunity. Nothing specific for COVID-19. Generally, it increases the immunity uh, to fight against any kind of conditions or diseases. Outside of that, I don't think it has any specific uh, benefit for COVID-19 that we know of. Thank you. Yeah. Let me ask the next in terms of uh, uh, turmeric, ashwagandha, uh, and pepper, and ginger. Okay, and, and so you, it looks like... Uh, yes. France is very similar though, and, uh, though we do not know the any kind of quote, any kind of studies, but this has been used ancient thing for a number of different things in India, and uh, with a lot of um, um, anecdotal reference that have been of people improving, especially using hot water, you know that mixture the cup, um, you know, with, in hot water setting. So again, not backed by anything else, but you know everything need not be backed up, but it's supposed to be helpful. Okay, and. Um... I can probably take the next uh, part of this. Um, there is also, you know, effect in terms of uh, doing pranayama, and in terms of these are breathing exercises, which if it is you are taught and you know how exactly to do it, it will really help in terms of keeping the respiratory system open and providing better oxygenation. But again, nothing specific with uh, COVID nineteen. Um, protects or not, but it is generally, uh, it is also immunomodulatory. And uh, so that is, you know, um, a as a practitioner, I would recommend that is something is to be good, pranayama, as well as the yoga, you know, is also another. It is both from the point of exercise as well as in terms of um, bringing the focus, you know, in terms of the mind and as well as some making the muscles and joints more uh, supple. 
uh, I think is, uh, is uh, acceptable. And uh, the third part is the meditation. And as you know, many meditation, many types of meditation goes on and you can definitely see, it doesn't make any difference whether COVID-19 or not. Again, no studies as uh, other physicians have said specifically with this, but meditation is something that would be good for you. Particularly what Dr. Chetna Rao said about emotional burden. I mean, in terms of that emotional burden, seem to have significant effect, benefit in terms of yoga and pranayama. And so this is something that you can uh, look at from that point of view. And uh, there is a, another question is in terms of use of melatonin. Uh, does anybody have any uh, I want to address? I think they all physicians respectively decline, you know, in terms of this. Um, one other thing that had come in place is the use of baby aspirin, because uh, as uh, Dr. Narasimhan said, it increases the risk of uh, uh, clotting um, problems in um, patients with COVID-19, even though, again, no studies have been done to show whether there is any specific effect with COVID-19. Uh, even uh, Anthony Fauci said uh, it is something that he will not have a problem. People who are in that age group, if above 50, it is recommended anyway. If you have diabetes, hypertension, it is also recommended. You know, so those people taking it fine. But you have to remember, you know, much older people, there is a risk of bleeding. So you have to keep that in mind. And uh, what time is it? So um, we are uh, reaching, you know, 12.26. We will be, for those of you who want to hang around, we'll just spend a little bit more time to answer the questions. And... Uh, um, the way that we, we do prioritize these questions depending upon what that we can quickly answer now and then the others we can answer later. And uh, um, uh, the question about posting this video webinar later, uh, Jay Raman and uh, Vasu can answer that question. Can this video can be posted later? Uh, yes, thank you, Dr. Shiva. Uh, we are streaming live on YouTube and will automatically be saved under the YouTube SSVT streaming channel. So right after this uh, call, YouTube will process this and it will be available for the public. Um, the other question is in terms of, you know, this something I think uh, it was to answer, um, that is um, whether this COVID virus will come back again. Um, Dr. Narasimhan, you wanna take the question? They are talking yeah. about, will it last for two years or will it come back again? Yeah, I will rephrase it a little bit uh, saying that will it go, ever go, go out again? Uh, this is actually the, um, going to be an ongoing issue. There's going to be, a, even over a period of uh, time, there's going to be a reservoir of infection somewhere. Um, so it, again, we need to wait and see whether it behaves like influenza and there's going to be a lot more mutation with this or it, it behaves like some other viruses which do not mutate that often. So it all depends on that. Um, but like I said before, the initial pandemic phase uh, in, in the extensive kind of a cases, whether it's going up or going down, but it's still remaining in pandemic phase, will last at least about 18 to 24 months. And after which, hopefully with our immunity, uh, it will be mostly seasonal. It's predominantly in fall and winter. This time we, we escaped the, the, uh, the, the winter portion of it because we started seeing it more in spring and a uh, little later. Fall and winter can be more severe than what we have seen now. So again, hopefully that will, you know, those are the things that need to be seen. Dr. Shiva, you're on mute. Yes, yes, I just saw that. Uh, there are two more questions. And uh, they, they are pets carriers of COVID because the reports of some dogs and cat having this. And if so, if you walk the dog or cat, uh, what precaution should we take? Who wants to answer this question? I can take a stab at it. Um, yeah. So, you know, obviously with the droplets and everything, uh, it would apply to pets as well as to um, human beings. So basically we're saying to treat pets as if they're your family member. 
Uh, so, you know, if you're walking uh, the pet and et cetera, please don't have them, um, you know, be in contact with other, uh, other people on, on the walking trail, for example, because if you've coughed something or if there's any droplets at home, it may have settled on the pet as well. Um, but I don't know about specifics where the pets are transmitting it to people other than that particular thing. Please, um, if somebody can answer that, I don't know. Again, we don't have uh, information. It is evolving in terms of the pets. And so I would probably leave it. Um, there are three or four questions about people visiting from New York and uh, are visiting to New York. What precautions have to take in terms of quarantine, in terms of um, recommendation for the, for the travel itself should or should not be doing? There are several questions from many places, but particularly New York, I thought I was important to answer. Yes, Dr. Narsimhan, you want to answer the question? The, um, essentially, at this time, anybody coming out of New York should be considered or, uh, having a higher exposure. It should be just a presumption, and they should go on a quarantine if they visit and visit your home at least for 14 days. Um, for us to visit New York until the 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 you know the infection starts uh, decreasing a little bit. One has to be very careful. New York City's unique problem is the um, the congestion when the people being close to each other and public transportation. The virus, as it was I think mentioned already, it survives in metal surfaces a long time. You know some of the earlier earliest ones would be it can be up to three days, but longer ones it can go up to seven days. So that is why public transportation poses a big risk, you know, the uh, touching and uh, going in the middle of the crowd and things like that. So uh, my suggestion would be to avoid going to New York for a while. Yeah, I, I think that's probably the better part of the valor. And uh, a specific question to Dr. Nagula, um, does the acid wash in the stomach, acid presence, does it have any effect on the coronavirus? Dr. Nagula, uh, unmute please. Yeah, I don't think we have any particular uh, specific study on that. Uh, but common sense tells me the acid is usually protective for any kind of uh, infectious or bacterial agents. Only from that point of view, you can answer, but not specific, specific for uh, COVID-19. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Um, boy, are there, I mean, there are so many questions. Um, Dr. Shiva, we got a question on uh, contact sports, uh, especially with children like soccer, field hockey, things like that. Any advice on, on yeah. that? Along those so lines? at this stage, you know, obviously, first of all, uh, clarif I mean, you know, in terms of the school systems as to when they will open and when they will be open for sports is number one. That has to be dictated by the state and uh, the school system. You know, that's uh, how we'll have to go by. The second is as I mentioned, the risk is in terms of the children with the contact sport become as a carriers. They may have milder disease, but they can carry the disease home. If particularly, if there are grandparents at home, you know, then there is an exposure to the grandparents from the children. And so that is one risk. You know, I mean, this is something obviously each family has to uh, make an assessment and uh, um, allow for in terms of it, there is no way to control once there's a group of children playing as to who are exposed, who are not exposed, who are carriers and who are not carriers. So, and particularly with children, this is a major issue. We have to keep that in mind. Good question. We will have more information as we move on. Next question, anything? Dr. Shiva, another uh, question. I'm just paraphrasing here from one of the congregation yeah. members. With so many tests going around, which would be the best to take? Or is, do we have a choice as a patient? I guess I'm extending the question. Or the providers just tell you take this. Yeah, Dr. Narasimhan, will you take this question? It is in terms of, first of all, COVID-19 testing. You know, there are two or three different tests or even more. And uh, then the question of antibody testing also, you can get in. Brief answer, please. Right now, the the there is a priority. There's a list of people who can get the testing. They want the, the, so they are going to go from the top and the testing is still, it is available. 
and uh, it is being aware, being provided to the ones who have the top priority. And this might prob this one we do not know how long this is going to continue. Um, it is it is limited to hospitalized patients and those with the, the COVID uh, kind of a symptoms um, that can be tested now. But as the tests become more available, then I think the, the you know it can be done for the entire population. That's how we decide when you know how, how much immunity exists in the population. Uh, uh, then another question. I think we have asked that and answered it. Um, okay. The question. The other question is in terms of um, these tests. Uh, does it cost money? You know. Does it? Uh, is it? Uh, from what I know of, CMS and the insurance companies are have been asked to pay for the tests, and you should not cost anything. There are also free. COVID screenings available in many areas, um, urgent centers, uh, and even as she said, private offices, large private offices, you know, they have the machine to be able to do it. And uh, the other question is any data suggesting COVID breakdown by race and ethnicity that you can share? And uh, do you have any information about the Indian community? Very, Go ahead, little, very little information so far. I mean, that is more based on um, studies. But it looks like in many, well, the India is facing similar issues with the large cities. You know, things focused with the larger cities, and um, and as of right now, I'm not aware of any significant information coming from the India. Yeah. But I can tell you, in uh, the report from New York. The Indian community also, people have been admitted and uh, including passed away. So it doesn't seem to, at this stage, you know, in the information preliminary, as he said, does it. The second, the other issue about the race is that there is a significant increase in African American, uh, you know, black population being affected, uh, both in terms of the in infection rate as well as in terms of you know, getting sicker, as well as in terms of getting admitted to the ICU, and as well as mortality. So there is a significant effect on uh, that community. And there is also next community is also the Latino community also has been affected. And so you have to keep that in mind from that point of view that it is. Um, Doctor, one question, if I may. Yes. Yes. Uh, the question, I'm just reading it. How important is intensity of exposure? Are all degrees of exposure equally important? So, uh, yeah, intensity of exposure is important, and Dr. Narsiman uh, can also add to that uh, because, you know, we see that in healthcare workers, especially in uh, emergency rooms and things like that, or where you have aerosolization. Uh, for example, if somebody is coughing or when they're, they're doing intubations, when they're putting a breathing a tube down the throat, those are high risk exposures for people. So the amount of uh, uh, bacteria is, I mean, amount of, sorry, virus is important in that situation. And the amount of exposure repeatedly is also important with that um, as well. Definitely, it is one of the things that we're trying to cut down when we're doing the physical isolation, putting the mask on, all of those things. That's why we're trying to reduce the amount of exposure as well. Dr. Narsima? It's extremely important. And that is the one that really makes a huge difference in getting the infection. The, 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 that's why when we go out, as uh, Dr. Rao said, the exposure risk for us is much less than healthcare workers, nurses especially, and doctors. Um, the wearing the mask and all prevents us, prevents the infection up to a point, but the, if, we, if somebody is sneezing on you or coughing on you, that makes a big difference. Thank you. Uh, Kashima, one more uh, role, yeah. of pro role of protein, I guess, eating during the COVID period. Does it matter one way or the other? The GA specialist, would you want to take that question, Dr. Nagula? Protein in generally uh, immunity, only from that point of view. I do not think we have any specific studies for COVID-19. Uh, protein increases the immunoglobulins, you know, that way you can have the defense mechanism. Uh, other than that, nothing for a specific for COVID-19. Thank you. 
Um, there is a question about uh, visiting uh, some family in New York uh, who is pregnant and uh, has a one and a half year old child. How soon can we visit? And this I think goes along you know, in terms of what our, uh, uh, Dr. Narsiman mentioned before. Uh, you know, at this point, um, it is challenging to be able to make those visits in New York. I fully understand the emotional uh, impact of uh, uh, you know, the, not being able to visit and uh, being present uh, during the time of the delivery as well as taking care of that uh, the toddler. Um, but at this point, especially in New York, you know, it becomes very challenging. And so you may have to, for better part of the valor, uh, maybe it is a very conservative advice um, to stay put. Would uh, the rest of the panel members agree on that? Okay. Um, other questions? Um, I think we have already exceeded the time, at, you know, uh, are there any questions, uh, Jairaman, that uh, we have uh, not fully addressed? Because um, we've covered most areas. Yes. Uh, there is uh, somebody who uh, specifically asked, can I get a pneumococcal shot uh, now that I'm 66 years old? Yes, yes, they can get a pneumococcal. That should be routine. Um, whoever, is, uh, whoever turns uh, 65, they need to get two pneumococcal vaccines. One is called Prevnar, another one is called Pneumovax. Uh, that has to be a year apart. That has to be taken routinely. Uh, so especially if they're at a higher risk for something, they, they should take it. But at the age 65, that's a routine vaccine. They should take that. Yeah, and in fact, I will piggyback an answer as a pediatrician. You know, this question has come to us many, many times. Should I take my baby for vaccination? And I can tell you, almost all the pediatric practices have made provision to bring the child and the father or mother, get into a separate place, not uh, mix with the ill children that are being brought in and quickly get the vaccine and go. We would strongly recommend that you maintain the vaccination schedule that the pediatrician recommends to you, whether it is two, four, six months, and one year and 18 months and so on. And you should take the vaccine. This is something many people, uh, again, the risk of trying to go to your physician office or something. On the other hand, if your child or, you know, has symptoms of non-COVID symptoms, the regular you know, issues that you might get, call your pediatrician. Most of them will do telehealth uh, review and that can be taken care of and verified and any medication to be given can be done. So you do not have to take the child for those purposes to the uh, uh, pediatrician's office. I'm sure this holds good for the adults as the, uh, Dr. Tirpaneri Rao said, that if you feel you have serious symptoms, even adults should call your doctor and talk to them. Don't postpone it. Let the doctor decide whether you should be taken to the emergency room or not. Would you agree with that, uh, Dr. Tirpaneri Rao? Yes, uh, we can't uh, uh, emphasize more because the people have to, as though you have, a, you don't have COVID. Okay, a lot of viral illnesses causes the same symptoms. So you don't know the distinction. I don't know. You don't know as a patient how to distinguish. So you need to call your doctor. If your doctor is not available, yeah, you know, please call the urgent care or emergency department. They will answer you what to do. You know, that is very important. But not don't neglect your own care. That's important. Okay. Um, any other questions, Jai Raman or Vasu, that uh, came in the additional email or anything here that... Uh... Uh, Dr. Siva? Yes. I, I want to say something else. Please. About the mental hygiene uh, during the circumstances because the people may be living alone or maybe one or two people living and maybe a lot of pressure on them because they're not able to visit other people and other, whatever this may be. But my advice at this time is very available in every state, basically, crisis centers, you know. You can call them and talk to them. They will advise you where to go, especially in Harford County in Maryland. We have a, a mobile crisis center. They actually come to your home. Now, because of the COVID situation, they may still come and knock on the door and talk outside and then may screen you. And there are various ways of protecting your mental health. 
because the people may not eat, they may be depressed, you know. So please protect against that. So call your doctor and then the crisis centers. Very yeah. important. Thank you, thank you. That's very, very important. You know, you have to keep that in mind. I also want to give uh, three community organizations which you can call to uh, get help, both in the you know the non-medical and medical questions. You know, HACSI, Hindu American Community uh, Service Incorporation, the Aim for Seva, as well as Seva International. All three of them have combined and. Uh, providing um, volunteers to answer uh, your, your questions. It's for medical questions. There is a panel of doctors that are available to give you answers. For the mental health issues, they have psychologists available to be able to uh, talk to them also. So these are three uh, throughout the United States. You know, you can call the, you know, Seva International, Aim for Seva and HACSI to be able to provide uh, this information. Um, I think it is 1245. We have taxed the doctors quite a bit, you know, in terms of answering all the questions. And uh, um, I would like to uh, close the session for today. And any remaining questions, uh, and including the questions that we have answered, we will put it as an FAQ. And also we'll put it on the appropriate site for all of you to be able to access it, even those of you, there are so many people outside the, um, um, the DMV area that uh, you all have uh, uh, called in. Thank, thank you very much for that. Um, let me thank again uh, the doctors, Dr. Chetna Rao, Dr. Narasimhan, Dr. Tripneni Rao, Dr. Ram Nagula for having made that time available. And as we said, the SSVT, uh, thanks uh, to Siswavashna Temple. And we also would like to um, offer the possibility of hosting it again in two to three weeks. And uh, so please uh, look for in the Facebook and uh, um, SSVT blast, uh, you know, such announcements. Um, I would like to close and hand it over to Vasu for any further announcements. Sure. Thank you, Dr. Shiva. On behalf of SSVT, all of us want to give our sincere thanks to all of you doctors. Uh, you did a wonderful session answering questions and giving accurate medical information regarding COVID-19. It is helpful for everyone. We want to thank all the audience for attending the town hall. As we said, we'll make the presentation available in the SSVD website. Video recording will also be available on YouTube. The channel is called SSVD Streaming Channel. As Dr. Shiva said, we will do another town hall in a couple of weeks. So please be aware of live streaming of the pujas on the YouTube and Facebook. In the YouTube, the channel is called SSVD Streaming. Hope to see you in the live streaming and the future town halls. Sarve Bhavantu Sukhinaha, Sarve Bhavantu Niramaya, Sarve Bhatrani Pashyantu, Mahakasthi Pachka Om Shanti Shanti Shanti. Thanks all. Thank you all. Thank I, just want, I just yes. want, to, I want to thank you Vasu and Jairaman and Manju for the, all the technical help and the leadership. Thank you. Absolutely. Without which Likewise. this would not have taken place. Thank you, Ram. Thank, thank you. you very much, thank everybody. You thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thanks a lot. Namaste. Namaste. Namaste.